Hey guys, Pastor Jürgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. Before we dive in, though, I always like to try to start with something funny. And so I want to quickly tell you a story I heard about an atheist who is walking through the woods. He's walking through the woods and kind of looking at creation, you know, well, not he wouldn't think it was creation, but looking at evolution. And suddenly a bear comes out of the woods and starts chasing him. He's running, trying to get away and he trips and falls. And as he falls, the bear comes over the top of him, raises its claw. And it's at that moment without realizing, he says, God, save me. Suddenly everything freezes. The world, the bear, everything freezes. And he hears a voice from heaven and the voice from heaven says, All of these years, you've denied that I exist. And now at the last second, when you're about to die, you call out to me and ask you to make you a Christian. The atheist thought about it for a second. He's like, oh boy, I guess I hadn't really thought of that. Um, He goes, I tell you what, how about you make the bear a Christian? So God says, okay, suddenly everything unfreezes. The the, the bear puts its claws down, puts his paws together and says, dear Lord, bless this food I'm about to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Y'all awake? Anybody a Christian in the house today? Come on. All right. Anybody ready for some lunch pretty soon? Amen. Make sure you pray over that meal. Amen. (laughs) You know, today I want to tell you a story or go through a story in Scripture. And the story in Scripture is one that many people have heard. Even people that aren't Christians have heard the story of David and Goliath. But hopefully I'm going to point out some things today that maybe you've never seen in this story. See, what had happened is this nation of the Philistines, they were coming against Israel and they were going to fight in this war. So they're in this valley. On one side is the Philistines. On the other side are the Israelites. They're facing each other. And this man comes out who happens to be a giant. He's nine feet, nine, six inches, nine feet, nine, six inches. No, six inches tall. Thank you. Y'all just stretch your hands this way and pray a special prayer for Pastor Jared. He's nine feet, six inches, there we go, tall. And he stands up and he says this. Hey, I'm a a warrior. You send your best warrior out, we'll fight. And whoever wins, the other side will surrender. Well, all of Israel is freaked out. They're scared because this guy is massive. Well, suddenly David shows up. He's there to visit his brothers. When he shows up, he's only 16 years old. And he hears this man defy Israel. And so he begins to say, wait a minute, this can't stand. I'm telling you, this cannot stand. We serve the God of heaven. If somebody needs to fight him, I'll fight him. Well, when the word spreads, they take him to the king. And when they take him to the king, this is what he says. And this is what my message is going to be about. In just a moment, I'm going to share it with you. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 37. Here's what it says. He looks at the king and he says, The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion... And the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Here's what he says. God did it before. And if he did it before, he can do it again. Maybe you're here today and you're going through a challenge. Maybe you're here today and you've gotten a diagnosis you didn't expect. Maybe you're here today and you look at the state of our country and and, and where it's at and you're like, what is going on? Evil is everywhere. It's out of control. Can I give you some good news today? If God did it before, how many know that God can do it again? Come on, shout amen. So we're going to pray a prayer right now, all right? Before we do, I'll, I'll tell you one more funny story. I heard about two antennas that fell in love on a roof and they got married. The wedding wasn't much, but the reception was amazing. And um, so would you do something with me? Would you raise your antenna towards heaven? And we're going to pray a prayer. Just kind of dial in to the frequency of heaven. Holy Spirit, I ask you to anoint everything I say, but not just the things I say. Anoint our hearts to hear and receive your word. Because, Lord, it can land on thorny ground or rocky ground, or it can land on good ground and produce a harvest. Lord, we prepare our hearts right now. 
speak to us. In fact, just take your hand now and put it over your heart and say this, Holy Spirit, speak to me in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Come on, look at, look at somebody and say, God can do it again. Now turn to your second choice and tell them, God can do it again. Do it again. Okay, good. We love those second choice people too. Amen. So today, here's what we're going to do. We're going to dive in and we're going to take the story of David and we're going to learn three ways or three things that we see from the story of David and Goliath where it kind of got things moving where God did it again. And I believe that he can do it again for you. I believe he can do it again in our nation. I believe revival is coming. God has great things in store. Let me tell you something. Our best days are not behind us. Our best days before are before us. I'm here to tell you, we serve a God who goes from glory to glory, strength to strength. That means he gets better and better as the days go by. Amen. He said, the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former house. Listen, the, for, the latter house may not be as big and as beautiful and have as many bells and whistles, but here's the important thing. The glory is better. The power is better. And I'm telling you, we are going to see, I'm confident in this, that we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. If you believe that, shout amen. amen. He's going to do it again. So... Let's start with the first point. We'll give you three points today. We're going to see God do it again. First thing that kind of is in that process of God doing it again is we have to, number one, write this down. We have to remember who God is. I know it sounds simple, but I want you to write it down if you're taking notes. If you're not taking notes, write it down. Remember who God is. You know, it's easy to get forgetful, right? Anybody a little older in life and you have kids and you've had kind of those, one of those senior moments of forgetfulness? Wave at me if that's you. Some of you forgot to raise your hand. We, we do. I have my kids come in sometimes and I'll look at them and literally be like, Macy, I mean, Haley, wait, wait, Tanner, wait, wait, Hudson. And I'll go through all of them. It's like I know them. <laughs> They're my kids and I can't remember their name. And you know what? It's, it's so easy in the world we live in when things begin to happen, challenges begin to come, we develop spiritual Dory syndrome. syndrome. Yeah. Remember the movie Nemo and there was that lovable fish that was so nice but would forget everything because they couldn't remember any short-term memory. It would, it would be lost. And, you know, that's kind of what happens for you and I is that it's easy when a problem comes or a giant shows up where suddenly we start developing this spiritual Dory syndrome where we've forgotten about our God. And what I love in this story is that David has a great memory. David looks at King Saul and he says, hey, listen, you might be a giant, but I got to tell you something. My God delivered me from the lion. He delivered me from the bear. I've got a big God. He tells King Saul, listen, God did it before. He can do it again. And then when he faces the giant, he stares the giant down and he reminds himself, he reminds his nation, he lets the giant know who his God is. Look at what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45 through 47. It says, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's army, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. Today, the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel and everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword or spear. This is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. I love that he remembered his God. You know, um, I'll kind of explain it this way. I um, one day went out to the park with my son, Tanner. At the time, he was a little younger, and I'm blessed to have four kids. I mentioned to him, and uh, three of them are in the ministry on staff with me. Another one's in a ministry institute right now. They love Jesus. And when my son was in junior high, he was really kind of learning to play basketball, and he was, he was just one of those vertically challenged kids, all right? He, he was vertically challenged. He wasn't tall. And so we went, went to the park to play basketball. And while we were there, he uh, saw these other two kids that looked like they're in high school. And they, were, they had to be on the varsity team because they were tall. They were dunking. They were just shooting. And have, so they come over to him. And they see that this little kid, you know, junior higher, and his dad, the old guy, is playing basketball. And they want to, you know, pounce on somebody. So they're like, hey, would you guys like to play two on two? And so Tanner's like, sure. And then he walks over to me. He's like, dad. They want to play two on two. I'm like, awesome. He's like, they're going to kill us. 
And I'm like, well, hold on a minute, son. I know you're just learning and I know you're not real tall, but you got your dad on your team. Come on, and the dads out there said amen. Come on, some of us are still living the dream from back in high school, right? And, and here's the thing, I, you know, in basketball, that was kind of my sport. I was involved in athletics and I, I played a lot of athletic, uh, athletic programs, but basketball was kind of my thing. And I broke a lot of records. I had opportunities at scholarships at D1 schools and I scored a lot of points. I could shoot the ball and I could play defense. And, and so I looked at my son, I'm like, son, why are you so down? Don't you know who's on your team? And then he remembered. He remembered the, the basketball in my, uh, my office. It says 1,001 points. He remembered all the, the articles and all the, the different stuff. He's like, oh, yeah, Dad, we're going to have some fun. Now, listen, I couldn't jump as high as I used to. I'm not as quick as I used to be, but I can still shoot the deep ball. And you know what? We destroyed those guys two games in a row. They walked away with their tail between their legs. Here's the thing. Tanner had forgotten who was on his team. And you know what? Every time a giant shows up in your life, every time a new trial shows up in your life, every time something happens that's a difficulty, the devil will use it to try to forget who's on your team. But can I remind you something? If God is for you, who can be against you? David stood in front of the giant, and here's what he said. He said, you might defy me, but you're standing against the Lord of heaven's armies. You've got the king of kings. You've got the Lord of lords. You've got the omnipotent one. You've got the one who says that heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. You need to remember something. No matter what's going on in your marriage, no matter what's going on in your business, no matter what's going on in politics, we still have a God in heaven who is on the throne. He didn't fall off in COVID. He didn't fall off in the elections. He didn't fall off when you left your job. He's still the provider. He's still the healer. He's still the deliverer. He is the God of heaven. And that is who is on your side. Somebody shout amen. Hallelujah. Remember who is on your side. You see, maybe Tanner got a little nervous because he realized I'm a little older. I'm not as fast. I can't jump. But can I tell you, God hasn't lost a step. He hasn't retired. He's not sleeping. He is still just as fast, just as strong, just as powerful. And here's what he says about you. I know the thoughts I have towards you, thoughts of a hope, thoughts of a future, thoughts to prosper you and not harm you. I can do exceedingly abundantly above you, above what you even ask, think, or imagine according to my power that is working within you. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Listen, we need to remember who our God is, that he is big and he is strong and no giant can stand against our God. Amen? Good preaching, Pastor Jared. Word. Some of you are like, man, why does he always want an amen? No, listen, I'm not insecure. It's just that the Bible says every promise of God is yes and amen. And if I, can, if I can just get you to say amen when you hear that he's a provider, if I can just get you to say amen when you hear that his name is Jehovah Rapha, our healer, maybe something will get a hold of your spirit to say, yeah, that's mine. That's my God who is able to do all things, even the things that are impossible with man. Amen. Amen. Somebody say, do it again, God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's a rescuer. He's a deliverer. And he'll set you free. Whew, man, I just feel the Holy Spirit here. Can you just sit in that for a minute? Can you just close your eyes for a minute and just think about how big your God is? Think about the, the things that he has accomplished in you. Whew, think about it. Come on, the devil, the giant jumps in your face and tries to tell you lies, roars like a roaring lion, but here's what you need to remember. You need to remember that God is on your side. Remember, hey, listen, you may not be where you want to be, but praise God, you're not where you used to be. Why? Because you have a big God. Whew. Come on, just think about some of those things that are in front of you where you need breakthrough. Come on, just somebody say, God, do it again. So the first principle, if he's going to do it again, is we need to remember who God is. The second principle is this, and that is we need to repeat what God has done. We need to repeat what God has done. David, he goes to the king, 
Now, why the king would even allow this, you know, 16-year-old kid to fight against the giant, well, that's a whole other message that we could talk about. I don't have time to preach today. But one of the things I do, do know is that when he meets the king, he talks to the king. It wasn't the first time he met him, actually. He'd been serving him. He'd played the harp for him and his, his home and the distressing spirits had been pushed away. So he knew who this young man was. And when he talks to the king, look what he says. In, in 1 Samuel 17, we're going to go back to verse 34. It says, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. Come on, how many wish they could have seen that? I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, oh my. And I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. Then watch what happens. Scroll a little later in the the story. He's about to go into battle against the enemy. And look what he does in verse 40. So he picked up five smooth stones from a stream, put them in his shepherd's bag. Now, that part makes sense to us because we know, if you know the story, that he killed Goliath with a slingshot, right? But then look what it says. Then armed with only a shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. When I read this part of the story, I hadn't really seen this part and, and focused on this part again, but it made me think. In fact, I've brought a staff today to kind of give you a picture, an illustration of what David might have had. We know that he had the slingshot, right? But but he went into the battle with the slingshot, and he went in with his staff. And we know that he killed Goliath with the slingshot, not the staff. So then the question is, why did he encumber himself with something unnecessary for battle? I mean... David had a, I'm sorry, the Goliath had a sword. How many know you don't want to fight someone with a sword with a stick? Why did he take it with him into the battle? And as I began to pray and study and do some research, I, I think I discovered what the reason is. You see, David went into the battle knowing that God could do it again. And here's what's interesting about staves, that staves were very important in, um, the home of an Israelite family. And here's why. Because the staff often was passed down from a father to a son. And when they would pass it from a father to a son, they would give it to them. And on the staff wouldn't just be the wood, it would be markings. As you can see, I've put Hebrew markings on this staff. And those markings represented things that God had done in their family throughout their family history. So literally, when they would pass down the staff, the staff was like giving them a journal of the testimonies of how God had moved in their life. So now watch, when David goes into the battle, he's not just going into the battle saying, I have a big God. He's walking into the battle saying, I'm not going to walk into this battle without my testimony. I'm not going to walk into this battle without making sure that I'm reminded, that the devil's reminded, that my friends are reminded, that my family's reminded, that my kids are reminded of what my God has done, the time he set me free, the time he healed my body, the time he provided when I didn't have any money, the time when he opened up a campus in southern San Diego when they said you can't have church. God who did it before can do it again. Somebody shout amen. Amen. See, he realized I can't go into the battle without repeating what God has done. Here's the question. Do you take your staff? Do you take your testimony over to the water cooler at work? Do you take your staff? Do you take that testimony with you to the dinner table when you're talking with your kids? It's interesting because I actually heard a, a passage of scripture, or I mean, I heard a pastor talking about a passage of scripture we're going to talk about in just a second. Because you realize that this principle of not only remembering who God is, but repeating what he's done is the biblical principle for victory and breakthrough. What does it say in Revelation? If you have a Bible, you can turn there. Revelation 20, 11, or 12, 11 says, and they overcame him through the blood of the lamb and through the word of their what? Through the word of their what? Their testimony. We undervalue the importance of repeating what God has done. Let me explain it to you this way. There was a pastor who had a a Jewish rabbi come to him and said, hey, I want to explain to you about that word testimony in the Hebrew. 
He said, as a, as a Jewish rabbi, we believe that there's power in the word testimony because here's what we believe. We believe that when we testify, that not only are we repeating something from the past, but the idea is that as we repeat that past action, it releases it into the present. He said that as, a, as, as Hebrews, we believe that when we repeat what God did in the past, it releases the same power for God to do it again. He said, we don't just talk to our kids about our history because we want to let them know our Jewish culture. We tell them because we want the God of our past to do what he did in the past in the present. So he said, what we've been doing in our synagogue is when we have people who are sick in the hospital, rather than just going and praying for them, we've been sending parishioners who've had healings in their body to the hospital to come and tell the story of how God has healed them. And he said, you know, we've discovered people are getting healed in the hospital. People are getting changed in the hospital. Why? Because they carried their testimony into their trial. And the next time a giant stands up in your face, the next time a trial comes your way. Not only remember how God is big and strong and mighty, but you know what you need to do? You need to raise that staff and say, listen, let me tell you about what my God has done, how he changed my life, how he transformed me. Just, just this week, I'll tell you a couple of stories. Just this last week, I had the head of our ushers department come to me. And he came up and he said, hey, Pastor Jared, he goes, I got to tell you something. Like, what's up, man? He said, you know, I, I uh, started coming to church about a year and a half ago. He said, he said, my whole life I've smoked. And because I've smoked, I, I got emphysema. About five years, I started going to the doctor every year to get checked. And, I, and the doctor said, I have the beginning stages of emphysema. He said, so I go back every year and I get checked. He said, it, you know, it gets a little bit worse and it's still there because, you know, there's no really way for it to go away. You're stuck with it forever. You can't be healed of it. It doesn't go away. And he said, but I got to tell you a story. Come on, anybody love that, right? Come on, feed me, right? And so he said, you know what? A year and a half ago, my family started coming to Higher Vision. We got saved. He said, we went through our DNA course, which is called Growth Track. We went through Growth Track. He said, now I'm serving. I'm head of the ushers team. So he said, I decided I was going to go back to the doctor and do my annual checkup for emphysema. He said, I got back from the doctor, and guess what? The doctor said, I don't know how to explain this, but you don't have emphysema anymore. He said... He said, Pastor, the doctor looked at me and said, that's impossible because it can't be cured. But how many know our God is a big God? And the things that are impossible with man are possible with God. Why am I telling you that story? You know what? I'm stoking your faith because maybe you're here and you need your back healed. Maybe you're here and you, you've got diabetes. Maybe you're here and someone here and someone diagnosed you with cancer. Can I tell you, if he did it before, he can do it again. Start taking your story. Start telling your testimony and watch. You will overcome by the blood of Jesus. And by the word of your testimony. Can I just throw one in? We tried to get a, a campus to have for a new location. And city said no. City said no. Kept turning us down. The, the permits kept going farther and farther. But how many know that God is able? God ended up, instead of us having to buy a campus, when they said no. In fact, can I just stop and tell somebody, you need to hear this. We thought we were going to do this facility. It was going to be this $8 million project, massive thing, a big step of faith for us. And we got back the answer, and the answer was no. Can I tell you, sometimes God's no might be God's greatest gift. Because what happened was, is after they said no, two weeks later, the pandemic hit. And we'd have been in this massive building program in the middle of a pandemic, can't have services, and here's the thing. God said no, and here's why he said no. Because about 12 months later, he knew he was going to give us a $5.3 million facility for free. Come on. How many know we serve a big God? And right now, 
Higher Vision Canyon Country is meeting. People are getting saved because I serve a God who can do the impossible. And if he did it for Higher Vision, he'll do it for Awaken. If he did it for me, he will do it for you. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Come on, somebody shout, do it again, God. Woo. Come on, amen. He may be seated. All right, so here's the takeaway. Homework. Go to lunch. Get some tacos and enchiladas and frijoles and, and then start telling your kids some of the stories of the faithfulness of your God. Remember who God is. Remember what he's done. And you ready for the last point? Repeat, or release the old for something new. Release the old for something new. I want to read to you now in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to go from verse 34, and we're going to jump all the way to, to verse 50. I know I'm kind of jumping back and forth, but I just wanted to bring these points to you, and I want to show this. When David is talking to the king, here's what he says. It says, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, we read this, right? I go after it with a club. Everybody say a club. So his staff he used in battle against the lion and the bear. He said, and I rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. Then verse 37. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. He did it before he can do it again. Verse 38. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. And then he says, I can't go out in these. Husbands, have you ever heard your wife make that statement? Just throwing that out there. Okay. Or how many of you had your wife tell you, you can't wear that? Come on, amen. <laughs> Okay, so just, just moving on. Just going deep in the Hebrew there. Okay, so uh, getting some of that heavy revy. Okay. He says, I can't go in these, he protested. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. And then what does he do? He picked up five smooth stones from a stream, put them in his shepherd's bag. Then armed with only his shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. And I love it. If you read it, I didn't put this in. But he says, you're coming to me like a dog with a stick. And we know what the stick was, right? The stick was the testimony of the power of God. And then he says this, you come at me with stick. And then verse 38 says, as Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag, taking out a stone, he hurled it with a sling, hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. I want to give you the last thought, and that is we got to let go of the old for something new. Because here's, here's a point, and I don't know if they have it, but I'm going to give it to you. It's this. A new enemy may require a new strategy. See, he'd beat the bear with, with the club. He'd beat the lion with the club. He, he was used to the club. He was used to, to having that weapon, but now he was facing a new enemy. And with the new enemy, he needed a new strategy. And I want to tell you something. You see, in those days, there were three types of soldiers. There were the, uh, the cavalrymen, and the cavalrymen got on horses, and they rode into the battle. Then you had what was called the... Um, uh, infantry or the swordsmen. And the swordsmen were like Goliath. They had a sword and they fought in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But then you had another group of warriors and they were called the slingers. And the slingers were the ones who used bow and arrow, but they also were known to use a sling with a rock like this. And they would begin to whip that around. In fact, this slinger, they, were, they got so good at it that they were able to get the velocity of the rock when it left the pouch was flying at the same speed as a nine millimeter gun. 
And they were known to be able to, from a distance of 200 up to 400 meters, the, the Romans talk about in, his, in history that their, their soldiers that had slingshots were able to hit a target the size of a face from 400 meters away. And interestingly enough, as I was praying about it, I'm like, God, why is it that David, you know, he, he grabbed the sling instead of the club because he'd already beaten the bear and he'd already beaten the, the lion with the club. Why did he bring the sling? And then as I did a little research and a little study, I discovered this. You see, what's interesting about Goliath is that he was a giant. And because he was a giant, it meant that because he grew so big, he had other physical deficiencies. And one of his physical deficiencies was his eyesight meaning that he couldn't see very well far away. He could only see close by. So in other words, the only way that he could fight effectively against his enemy is if David came against him with a club or came against him with a sword because he was putting the enemy at the advantage. But God said, I love you so much. If you'll just, like, he, like Pastor said earlier, see that I'm going to do a new thing, forget the former things. If you'll grab a sling instead of a club, if you'll take a new strategy, I'm going to position you where now your enemy doesn't have the advantage. You have the advantage. Your enemy doesn't have the opportunity for victory. You have the opportunity for victory because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Maybe a new enemy requires a new strategy. Problem is we're insane. So we're like, well, that's a little offensive, Pastor Jared. Thank you for, it feels so great. You're calling me insane. You, you know what one definition is? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And how many giants are still standing in your family? How many giants are still standing in our city? How many giants are still standing because we keep grabbing the club? Are you still bringing a club against Goliath? Or is God saying it's time to let me do something new? Maybe if your marriage is struggling, rather than doing what you always do, which is just yell and then go into separate rooms and watch TV until you go to bed. Maybe doing that over and over again isn't going to change it. Maybe it's, I'm going to come down and I'm going to get prayer. You know what? Maybe we're going to join the early morning prayer gathering that happens here at East Lake Campus. You know, we're going to call a counselor. We're going to get a different weapon because we have a new enemy. And how many know with God, all things are possible. No weapon formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that rises up against you will be silenced. This is the heritage of the saints. You have an inheritance of victory. But it may require a new strategy. But pastor, you don't understand. We kind of live under a spirit of poverty. You know, we grew up without much and we've never had anything. And financially, we've always struggled. And, you know, it's just, there's always more month than there is money. And, and, you know, I, I tip God every once in a while. I'll throw a 20 in every once in a while and give him a tip, you know, because it was good worship and everything. But, um, but, I've, but I've never really used the weapon that God has given me called giving him the first fruit. And when I do, he said that he will rebuke the devourer and open up the windows of heaven. Maybe the new strategy is it's time to start tithing and honoring the Lord so that he can put a slingshot in your hand. He can put a weapon in your hand to defeat the enemy. There is no enemy that will ever stand against the power of our God. So maybe it's time to get a new strategy. Can I give you the last thought with this whole let go of the old and something new? It's not just a new enemy requires a new strategy, but this is the other one. A new strategy may require practice. So David put on the armor and he starts walking around. He's like, I can't fight in these. I can't even walk in these. I'm 16. This doesn't fit. He says, I haven't used these. What's he saying? I haven't practiced this. In other words, victory doesn't come with the weapons you've been given if you haven't practiced with the weapons that you've been given. He didn't just go into the battle and grab a slingshot and say, let's go for it and see what happens. He was out in the field day after day after day after day. And he's like, you know, maybe his brother's there. And he says, hey, I'm going to hit that rock 40 yards away. You can't hit that rock. Well, yeah, check this out. 
And he's, he's like, oh, I missed. I was six inches short. And time and time again, he practiced over and over and over and over and over again. And you know what? It just kind of stirred in my heart for some of us that were here today. And we get a little discouraged, you know, because we're serving at the church. And we just kept serving even when times have been tough. And, you know, we give and we honor the Lord with the tithe even when maybe they cut back at the company. And we're unsure about what's going to happen with our job. And there's a little insecurity there of our financial future. Or maybe we're looking at other things, uh, you know, with family. And it's always been that way. And it's never going to change but we just keep on loving them, keep on praying for them. Listen, you know what comes to mind? The scripture which says in Galatians, be not weary in doing good, for in due season you will reap if you don't give up. Sometimes the message is just keep on practicing, keep on being faithful, keep on praying, keep on lifting your hands when everything isn't going right. Keep on giving in the offering, even though you haven't had your breakthrough. Keep on serving, keep on serving, keep on being faithful because because due season, God will do it again. If he did it before, he can do it again. Come on, somebody shout amen. All right, all right, we'll end with this. We'll end with this, okay? Because I know everybody's hungry, so am I. It's a story about this group of college students. They came from Wheaton Bible College and they went to England. This was many years ago, many, many years ago. And when they went to England, they decided to tour John Wesley, the great revivalist of England. They decided to tour his house. They walked into the house and the tour guide began to take them through the rooms and they were just checking it out and like amazed. They get upstairs and they go into the bedroom of John Wesley. One of the students looks to the tour guide and says, sir, what... Why are there two holes in the carpet right next to the bed? The tour guide said, oh, that's because John Wesley every day would get on his knees and would cry out to God and say, God, use me to change this nation. Use me to change the world. He said he did it every day. He just kept praying. He kept praying. He didn't stop. He didn't give up. He just kept praying. He just kept praying and he wore holes in the carpet. The students were, you know, amazed, like, wow. So they got up to leave, and they got in the bus, and they're driving away. And as they're driving away, one of the teachers stands up on the bus and says, hey, guys, hold on. I think we left someone. And they began to count, and they're like, yeah, we have one missing. He said, we got to go back and get him. So they turn the bus around, and they go back to the house. And when they get in the house, the teacher jumps out, and he runs into the house, and he's looking around. He goes into the kitchen, goes in the living room, but doesn't see anything. But as he gets to the bottom of the stairs, suddenly he feels like this overwhelming sense of God's presence. He's like, whoa, what is that? He walked to the top of the stairs and he felt it again. It was like a wave that hit him of the presence of God. And then he heard this murmuring and and he, he walked up to the room of John Wesley and as he peeked through the door, this young man who was in the tour was on his knees in the same holes as John Wesley whispering a prayer. He couldn't quite hear, but he just felt this overwhelming sense of God's presence. And so he snuck up next to him and put his arm around him. As he leaned down, he heard these words. Do it again, God. Do it again. Do it again, God. Do it again. He sat there for a moment in that moment of God's presence, realizing something was happening. And then he grabbed the young man by the shoulder. He looked at him. He said, Billy, it's time to go. And Billy Graham stood up and walked out of that house. And if you know the story of Billy Graham, you know that he preached in person to over 200 million people. That he preached the gospel to 2.2, through media, 2.2 billion people heard the message of Jesus. And millions of people gave their lives to Jesus Because I want to tell you something. God's looking for some people who will dare to believe that if God did it before, he can do it again. I'm here to tell you, God can do it again. America hasn't seen its worst days. This globe hasn't seen their worst days. Our best days are before us, not behind us because God is a God who loves this world. He loves you, and he has good thoughts towards you of a hope and of a future to prosper you and not harm you. 
Come on, can you just a moment, just lift your hands for just a second and just say, God, do it again. Think about your kids. Think about the callings that are on your life. Think about the, the, the kingdom that needs to come in this southern San Diego region. God, do it again. Bring revival again, God. Bring miracles again. Lord, may we see the lame walk. May we see the blind see. Lord, like we haven't seen in years. Open up heaven. Pour out your spirit. Lord, I pray a special anointing on Pastor Jurgen and Leanne. I pray a special anointing, Lord, on this campus. Lord, on Mike and Lord, on Katie. Lord, I declare release your power, your anointing like you did with David. And Lord, do it again. Kill giants, God, here. Lord, bring miracles. Change hearts. There's somebody, close your eyes for a second. There's somebody here in this room, and you used to be in ministry serving, but because of hurt and because of things that people said, you walked away. And you said, That's it, I'm done. But something has gotten you back to church and and you're reluctant, but you're here. And what the Lord is saying is that it's time for him to heal that hurt, wounded heart. And it's time for you to say yes and serve again. No more excuses. No more sitting back and saying, well, I need this time to heal. God says it's time. It's time. He wants you to serve again. He wants you to do it again because he's gonna do something in you that he couldn't do before. In fact, I just want to pray right now. I want everyone to close your eyes. If, if I'm talking to you, if God's speaking to you, I want to pray a prayer over you right now. Where are you? Lift your hand high. Who was that? Okay, keep it up. Keep it up. Father, in the name of Jesus, I break, Lord, the discouragement. I break the lies of the enemy that they're going to get hurt again. That, that you know what? Every church is filled with hurting people and hurting people hurt people. And so I just got to stay away. I break the lie of the enemy in Jesus' name. And I release within them an open heart, Lord, of faith and of trust. Lord, reactivate their calling. Reactivate their gifting. Reactivate, Lord, what you call them to do in the name of Jesus. We tear down every lie of the enemy. We take it captive to the obedience of Christ. In Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say, do it again, God. Do it again, God. Do it again, God. Do it again. I want you to close your eyes, everyone, for a moment, and I want to ask this question. Maybe you're here, and you haven't ever experienced a miracle. Today, you can leave with the greatest miracle of all time. It's called the miracle of salvation. See, if you're here and you're not sure if you're going to heaven, if you're here and you know things aren't right between you and God, did you know that you can walk out of this place knowing that you're going to spend eternity with Jesus forever? Here's what stops that. It's sin. Hey, I know some of you are like, oh my goodness, there he is. That pastor, those preachers, they're pointing their finger and say, sin or shame on you, shame on you. No, the goodness, the miracle is that it's not shame on you, it's shame off you. Is that when you receive Jesus, he removes the stain of sin. He removes the shame of the past and he makes you a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things are made new. Today, he's gonna say shame off you and he's gonna heal you and restore you and you'll be able to go to heaven. You'll be able to live your best life and fulfill God's purpose here on earth and the one to come. So if you're here and you want to go to heaven, you have to have the courage to confess your sin, admit it, repent of it. And secondly, you have to call on Jesus. So are you ready? I'm going to count to three. When I say three, you're going to lift your hand. Now maybe you're here and you've prayed that prayer before, but you've walked away and you need to reconnect, recommit to Christ. I'm talking to you too. This is your moment. This is the miracle. <laughs> heaven is about to go bananas. As the Bible says, when one person accepts Jesus, they rejoice and celebrate. So when I say three, are you ready? You're going to lift your hand and put it back down and then pray a prayer with me. You ready? One, you can be forgiven. Two, you can have eternity to be yours. Where are you right now? Three, lift them up, lift them up. Where are you? Thank you. Who else today? Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Who else today? You say, yes, pastor, you're talking to me. Anybody else today? All right, you can put your hands down. Thank you. Now I want you to pray this with me. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, and you'll be saved. Say, Jesus, today I confess I've made mistakes, I've sinned, and I need a Savior. 
come into my life. Change me. Forgive me. I put my faith in you as the Son of God and Savior of the world, starting today in Jesus' name. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen, for more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.